Hello everyone, I'm science illustrator and artist Matias Lanas. In today's video, I'm going to be exploring how to paint mountains with watercolor, inspired by Tony Foster's painting of Mont Blanc, a beautiful mountain in the Alps of France. Tony Foster traveled to Mont Blanc in 2012 as one of four artists invited to paint in the Alps for a French documentary, Artistes d'en haut, or Artists from Above. Also celebrated in this documentary is Tony's luminary for this exploring beauty artwork, a senior mountain guide, Lionel Wibo. Tony Foster took great care to select his vantage point for this artwork, and he painted Mont Blanc from above Bel Air on site for one week. Tony captures a surreal sense of the wildflowers, conifer trees, a waterfall, swirling mist, and a frigid mountain. Mont Blanc, which translates to White Mountain, is the tallest peak in Europe's Alps mountain range. Something that I really like about this piece is the way that the foreground hills crisscross one after the other and move into the middle and eventual background of the mountain. This draws your eye into the scene and it creates a sense of space and depth in the landscape. In my demonstration today, I'll be working in a more simple style to create a sense of depth through layering landscape forms, which will activate that same sense of depth and vast expanse. A more thorough instruction would require digging into more of the background context about drawing techniques, such as treating mountains like cone shapes and using that visual to guide where light areas and where shadow areas appear. But for simplicity and for time's sake, I won't go into that here. Instead, my goal is to practice a draw what you see philosophy and use direct, unbiased observation to fuel this great painting that we're about to make. In this episode, I'll be taping down my watercolor paper to a board, both for stability and to leave clean, straight edges on my finished piece. If you're planning on following along and you haven't yet seen it, be sure to check out my materials video for what supplies you're going to need to paint watercolors alongside me. For this demonstration, it'll be important to have a reference photo of the specific mountain that you'd like to paint. Or, if you're working outdoors, you can paint from life. I'll be painting from this photo. I'll start with a pencil drawing of the major mountain forms. Let's dive in. I've gathered a bunch of reference photos that I'm going to be using to look at different kinds of mountain shapes to inspire the mountains that I'm going to create today. And I have a variety of images that in particular show different layers in the landscape. So starting with something that is the foreground, something that's closer to us as the viewer, then generally something in the middle that we'll call the middle ground, and then all the way in the back, the background, which are the darkest mountains in this particular one here. Now, I also printed out one of these images of an aerial mountainscape, just to give you a sense of what mountains look like from above. A lot of us may have not stopped to think about what mountain shapes really are, and it's helpful to think of them as these 3D objects that are being hit by sunlight, which means that part of them are gonna be cast in shadows, and then here's just one more image of a mountainscape with those layers. The foreground here with vegetation, all the details and the shrubs we can see. The middle ground being this darker layer here. And then the background being that kind of hazy mountainscape that we see. So first I'm going to create my own mountainscape inspired by these photos here. I think I'm going to base it primarily this time on this photo at the bottom and maybe a little bit of this one. But the point here is I want to create some nice layers in my landscape to create that sense of depth that we're seeing in the Mont Blanc painting. I'm going to start out by penciling in just a light outline for a foreground. Something like that. We're going to do a little bit of a crisscross as well with these mountain shapes. These are what I am thinking of as rolling hills. And any shape like this kind of a sinuous organic shape works pretty well. And now we're going to throw in maybe some taller hills in the back. And I don't want to make these too regular because then they start to feel like they're not part of nature. They've become a little too uniform. This last layer here will be my more jagged mountains. Something like that. Got some nice layers there and each of these will be painted with different levels of intensity and that'll really stretch out our landscape into 3D space and give us that sense of vastness that I'm looking for. And I'll do a bit of cleaning up. I wanna keep my lines light in general. That looks pretty good. 
and I might decide to add a little bush or some plants, some grasses or something in this foreground one. But for now, I'm gonna hold off. I wanna keep this pretty simple. Next, we're gonna start with the sky. So I'll grab a flat brush, moisten that brush a little bit, and we're gonna mix blues today. So I'm gonna pre-dampen this space and I'm gonna use my French ultramarine mixed with a little bit of cerulean for my sky. And I'm gonna pre-mix this so that I have my color ready to go. And then as I've done in other videos, I'm gonna take my clean wet brush and just pre-moisten the paper. But this time I'm just gonna do it in the areas where I want the sky. So I'm gonna use the edge of the brush and be careful to go right along this line that I've drawn for the back most mountains. Now I'll take my pigment, make sure I soak a lot of that up and then just start to drop that in. And in this case, I'm gonna remove just a little bit from down here to create some clouds just behind the mountains to lighten up this area a touch. All right, and now we let this dry. We're gonna start with the backmost layer of these mountains and work really hard to create a sense of vast space between the first layer here, the foreground and the background, which, is, which are these mountains. And in order to do that, we have to think about a, a concept known as atmospheric or aerial perspective. An atmospheric perspective basically just refers to the way that we see objects that are far away from us, the way they're influenced by the amount of atmosphere or air between us and that object. So the general trend for landscape paintings like this is that objects that are very far in the distance, like these background mountains, are gonna be more hazy, less detailed uh, and, and unsaturated, not as intense in color. And we tend to see colors that are more in the blue purple end of the spectrum so even if you have vibrant yellows and reds because of the amount of atmosphere between us and that object we'll tend to lose those particular colors and end up seeing more of the blues and purples so for these mountains back here i'm going to mix up some blue and purple start over here with some french ultramarine and then a little bit of permanent rose and I'm going to keep it slightly more blue than purple. Let's do a little test. So that's pretty good. So mix up enough of your color and then make sure it's not too intense when you put down your test swatch. And now we're just going to add this in to our mountain area and you get to redefine the edge along the pencil lines that you made. We, are, we want to create enough of a contrast with the clouds or the light sky right behind the mountains, but also don't want these mountains to be too, too bold. There we go. And I'm just going to drop in a little bit more color for variety here and there, like so, just to create some variations in this very smooth mountainscape that I created. In general, I'm adding a bit more color to the bottom, but that it should spread out because the paper is still very moist. But you can see I have nice contrast with the bright white light cloudscape behind and then a sharp crisp edge where my rolling hill is going to be the first one in this series of layers as we come back towards the foreground. While I'm waiting for this layer to dry, I have some perfect examples of atmospheric perspective in these photos. So you can see here, we have three different layers, the foreground, the middle ground, and the background where the mountains are. And you can see the background mountains are much more hazy and less detailed as compared to the front mountains here. You can just tell that there's, there, it's almost like there's a mist over them. And a lot of that is just the effect of the atmosphere on the color that we're perceiving. In this one down here, we have the same thing, the background hills are much more diffused and you can't see a lot of the details the way that you can see the shadows and sharp edges on these front mountains. 
they're also a lot more desaturated. It's almost like they're covered in a haze. And then over here as well, you can see very well the bluey purple tint of these mountains. Of course, the rock may be a different color. It might be a different composition of the rocks that we're seeing up front. But atmospheric perspective still comes into play in terms of giving it more of a blue purple hue because of how far away they are. Now that this layer has dried, we're going to move on to the next one. So here's a little trick. Because we want continuity between the layers, I'm going to just reuse the color that I mixed for this back layer and add new colors to it. So there's a bit of that same color in this next layer. Um, for this one, I'm going to be working with burnt sienna. So I want it to be brown and a bit slightly more intense than the color, of the color in the background. So let's test it. It's not very intense, so I'm going to add some more burnt sienna and maybe re-add in some of these same colors. So a bit of the French ultramarine and then a tiny bit of either alizarin crimson or permanent rose. And here you get to gauge your color based on what you feel is right. If you want it a little more on the brown side, you can add a bit more red, a little a bit more permanent rose or alizarin crimson or some burnt sienna. If you want it more on the bluey side and more in harmony with the back purpley blue color, then you can add more of the French ultramarine. Let's test this one. It's a little bit more intense. Let's try this. So now, same as before, I'm just gonna add this in and go right up to the edge and reinforce that edge that I had created last time. Use broad, smooth strokes and lay your brush at a fairly flat angle so that you get the edge of it running up right against your pencil line. There we go. And so now we're gonna let this dry. And on to the next layer. So same as before, I'm gonna reuse this color and I'm gonna mix in some new. So this time I wanna go a little bit brighter, a bit warmer. I'm gonna use some of my yellows, yellow oranges. Um, we'll start with some cadmium yellow and a little bit of yellow ochre as well. Let's try that, that might be a bit intense, but I can water it down if need be. I'm gonna add a bit of my burnt sienna to it because it feels a little too bright right now. And then another good way to subdue something that's too bright is to add its complement. So we're gonna add some French ultramarine to this bright yellow a little bit of quinacridone violet. Let's see if that subdues it. There we go. So a bit more brown now, less bright yellow. Do a quick test. Better. And we'll put this right in, same as before, right up along the edge. Again, this is kind of a stylized landscape. It's just a made up landscape demonstrating the principles of atmospheric perspective and trying to create the sense of space in a mountainous landscape. When we're working from life or working from a photo, we'll be paying more attention to the specific colors that are at play in that scene and trying to color mix more appropriately to match what's there. But in this case, this is more theoretical and we just want it to look nice. And last but not least, let's move to this last layer here. So for this one, actually, I think I wanna make this slightly different than the background layers and make it feel like it's much closer to us than these three background layers, the middle ground, second middle ground, and all the way background layers. So I'm gonna try mixing some new color here. And we'll take a, just a dab of my previous color, but I'm gonna add some Windsor yellow to this and keep it re relatively light. Not a lot of pigment to water ratio, so that it, it's just a bit lighter. We'll test that out. And I'm going to run this down over the front. Again, part of what we're doing in creating these layers is, is trying to use contrast to evoke a sense of depth. And so a nice light layer here at the front creates good contrast with this darker layer behind it. So I can let that be for now. But if I wanted to, I could start to add some more interesting variety or details to this front one, such as we could add some French ultramarine to this mix here, make it just a bit darker, more neutralized, maybe a little bit of Indian red. And while it's still wet, I can create some, just some blooms of vegetation of sorts. 
just some areas of interest, some variety, because we are up at this really close layer now, we can start to have more detail in here. Just something to break up the space a bit. And that's enough, and now I can let it be and just dry like that. And there we have it, a pretty simple layered landscape that gives you a good sense of depth and was done really quickly. One thing I could have done slightly better is creating more of a difference between some of these layers in terms of intensity. So this back layer is actually fairly dark and I could have made it much lighter and still created good contrast with the clouds behind it. But I think it still works because of the way that the colors are changing, going from purple or blue to a complementary color, yellow, of the foreground. So now we're gonna try working from a photograph to create something that is inspired more by the particular color palette that we're seeing in this photograph. For this one, I've gone ahead already and drawn out some of my landscape based on this photograph here. So this is the one I'm gonna be choosing my color palette from and sort of being inspired by, although I'm not gonna stick completely to life with this one. So for example, I may omit some of these clouds, but you can see I've drawn out most of the general shape of the mountainscape here so that I have the outline and that'll be really useful for me, like in the first exercise, to gauge where those different elements will sit and to help me create that effect of depth in the landscape. And one thing that's different in this piece is we have a little bit of snow in these mountains. So I'm gonna create that by either omitting certain areas and leaving them white, or by using Liquid Mask, our Frisket again, and applying that beforehand. So I have this bottle of Frisket, and I'm gonna use the back of a thin brush this time and just create a couple of applications here and there where I would like a little bit of snow to be. And you can use another brush if you'd like, or you can use an applicator tip. Back of a brush works pretty well for me. And again, a reminder, if you are using a brush, make sure it's a sort of a throwaway brush because you won't wanna be using it for watercolor painting after you've used it for your frisket. The frisket tends to ruin the brush a bit. All right, so I've added a couple spots. That'll save me from having to think ahead of time which areas I want to keep white, and I can just paint over the whole thing and then remove the frisket at the end to get my areas light again. So now we'll move into the painting. And just like before, I'm gonna start with the sky. So I'm gonna reuse this blue area here. We'll get some French ultramarine and a bit of cerulean blue. Mix those together and let's check our intensity. That looks pretty good. So I'll remove as much of this pigment and water mixture as I can before I clean off this brush. And then take my clean brush and pre-moisten the paper like before. And I'm gonna go right up against the edge of my piece. And now we can drop in our blues. So let's soak up a bunch of this mixture that we have and start layering it in from the top. And I'm gonna bring it just to the edge of where I want some of my clouds to be so that I can let the blue bloom just around there, create kind of fuzzy clouds in this case. Something like that. And that looks pretty good, so now we'll let it dry. For the mountains in the background, I'm gonna mop up First of all, mop up this layer, this puddle here, so that I have a clean working space since we won't be using that color for this piece. And like before, I'm gonna choose something that is more in the blue-purple realm of the color spectrum, just because of atmospheric perspective. This one's pretty dark. It's more of a gray than a purple in this photograph. So we'll actually, we'll work in this blue area here and just reuse this color. So I'll take a bit of Let's try the quinacridone violet this time. Add that in. It's a very bright purple. And let's do some of this alizarin crimson as well. And we'll want to subdue this brightness to get it to be more dark, more gray. So we'll add some complementary color, such as a cadmium yellow. Ooh, and way too much. This is, this is the way color mixing works. You go one way and then you go the other way and you add too much of one, so you add more of the other one. You're always balancing these out. 
added some French ultramarine, and now some alizarin crimson. And we've got a yucky brown, which might be good for this mountain, but to me it's still a little too brown. We want something that's more neutral, not as bright in the red. So let's add some more French ultramarine to that. There we go. Now let's test this color. So from what I can see, it's still a little too browny red. This is more bluey. So I'm gonna mix French ultramarine in here. Okay, let's test that out. That's much closer. I think I'm gonna go with that. So we'll take this color we've just mixed up and just like before, I'm gonna go right up against the edge. Like so. And you can see where I left the liquid masking fluid, the colors being preserved. So that's gonna be the patches of snow that I have in my mountainscape. So now let's let that dry. Now I'm gonna mix up this next color. It's a little bit more brown than what we're seeing in the purpley blue background mountains. So I'm gonna generalize this color and get something close to, it's actually already, this is looking like a good start. So I might just reuse this color here. This was the yellow ochre and a bit of the Windsor yellow, yellow that I'd mixed together before. So we'll grab some of that and we can add a little bit more to it. And a bit of our background color, of course, always useful. Uh, ochre, maybe a little more Windsor yellow. Let's test that out. So that's looking close. Maybe it needs a bit more red. I might try some of the Indian red. And I'm just gonna mix, mix up more of my color just to have a larger quantity to work with. Indian red, some Windsor yellow. Let's test that. Looks pretty good to me. So I'm going to work with that now for this general area here in the middle ground. So I'll take this color and just start to add it in. I actually notice these two shapes, dark shapes in here are these shapes right there. So I'm going to omit those. Those are part of my, they're closer to my background than they are to my middle ground. So we'll just leave those white for now and I'll come back and add in my background color to that later. This landscape is a photograph that I took from a place called the Alabama Hills in California here in the United States. And it has some pretty unique weathering of granitic rocks that make it a, a, a pretty good site for filming Western movies. A lot of Westerns have been filmed here. The landscape is so, so dynamic, so iconic. Um, it made a great example for this demonstration what, with all the layers to paint. And now, since this is still wet, I can take advantage of that and, and look more closely at my photograph, see if there's some areas that need more intense coloration. For example, right here, I'm seeing a darker patch, right here, potentially a darker patch. And so I might grab some of my old colors, uh, some of the, the dark colors in particular, and drop in some colors where appropriate to give it a bit more visual variety, something like that. It's almost like you're just giving it a little bit of texture at this point. If it's too wet, you'll lose a lot of that texture as the watercolor dries and it, it flows. But if it's just moist enough where you can add color and it softens that color, but also keeps some of the shape that you're applying, you know, that's kind of the sweet spot you want. Good enough, so I'm gonna let that dry now completely. And my last layer, the foreground, is gonna be a diluted version of the one right behind it. So I'm gonna take this same color. I might add a bit more of a reddish hue to this, uh, but I'm gonna keep it pretty diluted. Some water, I'll grab a tiny bit of Indian red. Let's test that out. Not noticing the red, so let's see that. Pretty good. And you just layer that in. The good thing about a light application like this is you can see a lot of the pencil marks behind it. So that allows me to go in later and darken up those areas that I've already drawn out. While I'm waiting for this to dry, I'm gonna go ahead and start on the background since I can work on that without it interfering with the foreground layer. So first I'm gonna fill in these areas I missed by just reusing the same color that I'd mixed up previously. So I'll grab that. I'm also gonna mix in a bit more 
of these dark, intense colors. To me, it's a, it's a pretty profound purple there that I'm making. So I think I'll add some French ultramarine, a bit of quinacridone violet to that mix to make a pretty dark purple. And then you can take that color, layer it into these areas, but also create a darker layer or some of the mountain shadows. You see these chiseled faces on these mountains in particular. And we, you see some of those on Mont Blanc as well in Tony Foster's painting. And a good way to create those, those chiseled edges is by reinforcing the shadows where they fall with a darker color. And so blues and purples are really good for that in particular. Get a bit more blue. I'm gonna start a separate well here. Add in some of my previous color. So we've got a very muted blue, almost like a gray blue. And I can take that color and depending on where the dark areas are, I can just start to carefully add in those details of dark chiseled faces. some of these areas a bit. I'm paying attention to details now in this photo and just trying to capture some of these sharper edges that are so prominent in this composition, in these mountains in particular. Something like that, just a bit more texture. I might even drop some of this color now into these mountains here, these two features, because they are much darker than the surrounding area. But with your mountain, just pay attention to the shapes, pay attention to the lights and darks, and try to mimic those areas, create contrast between layers. And now we'll let that dry. Our mountains are basically done in the back, and so we're going to work on the foreground a little bit, and I'm not going to try to mimic all this detail, but we'll just try to get a, a basic sense of what that looks like in this piece by using the very tip of the round brush. So I'll start with this front layer. Again, we'll get back to this, and I'm going to take a bit of the previous color I'd mixed up, this one down here, and I'll mix in a bit more of the Indian red just to create a color that will be suitable for the shadows around some of these rocks. These, these are actually boulders. Um, you can see lots of intricate shadows going on there. We're not going to work too hard to try to create, recreate that texture. There's actually not a whole lot of difference in this between this foreground layer and the middle ground layer. They sort of blend into each other. And I want to reinforce that in mind so that we get more of a sense of that space, that depth going on. I'm going to make sure that that contrast stays present in this piece. But I am going to create a bit of texture here at the base um, just by sort of accentuating what some of these boulders might look like as a, as a texture. So I'm being loose and just sort of adding little marks to my dry watercolor. So I've done it in red. And now I'm gonna add a very muted green. So I'll use this little green that I have here in the corner. It's just like a hooker's green, maybe a bit of viridian and I'll just mix it in with some of the red that I had previously used so that it, it mutes it down. That's adding complementaries together. Touch in a couple of spots here and there like that. All your greens in nature are gonna be pretty muted, um, especially if you're looking at landscapes. So you're gonna want to add some reds to them just to bring them down from their sort of bright Crayola color to something that's a bit closer to an earth tone, something you'd see in nature. And then I'm gonna do a similar thing with this middle layer. So for this one, I'm gonna use more of my blue mixture from the mountains in the back. And I'll just make sure that it's diluted so it's not such a harsh, intense shadow. I've added some water to this. Let's test that out. It's just kind of a very muted purpley color. Get my brush wet and just start to sort of sculpt in more 
details, emphasizing the, the line, the edge between the foreground and the middle ground so that it creates more of a contrast between those. It's like this, this is almost like a valley here, cast in shadow. And then the top of the ridge is the, the area that's more lit. Okay, and I think that's pretty much it. If you wanted to, you could wait till this dries and then mix up a very muted, very neutralized green or something that's closer to a green gray and create a little bit of a stylized bush or pine tree or something like that. Since I don't have that in this landscape, I'm gonna skip it for now. And in a future video, I will work on trees. But for now, I'm just gonna leave it as this staggered layering of landscape elements that really push the depth to create the vastness that I'm looking for. And that is similar to what we did in the first piece. And now that this is done, I can remove my tape. So this is the unveiling ceremony. Last but not least, I'll remove the masking fluid from this bottom painting where I added it for my snow. And something I like to do at this point is just take a bit of my mountain color and come back in and you know, kind of use a, a dry brush so it's so I don't have too much water on the brush right now. And it's mostly pigment and just do a couple of passes over the snowy areas just to break up some of that really harsh edge that the liquid mask gives anything that's done with it. It also helps to break up the snow just a bit more so that you get more of like a scree pattern just in a couple places here and there. And there we have it, a mountainscape one that's more of a simplified version, and then one that's more based off of a photograph. I hope you enjoyed getting acquainted with mountains through painting with watercolor, and that you've learned enough at least to get you started tackling these gargantuan and varied subjects. Becoming proficient with watercolor takes time and practice, but more importantly, it takes experimentation and fun. If you want to continue with this journey as I explore other subjects in watercolor, give this video a like and consider subscribing to this channel. You can also visit The Foster at www.thefoster.org. Thanks for watching.